Your sister sits beside the king. Your brother is a great knight, and your father the most powerful lord in the Seven Kingdoms. Speak to them for us. Tell them of our need here. You have seen for yourself, my lord. The Night's Watch is dying. Should an attack come, I have three men to defend each mile of the wall. Three and a third. <sighs> Tyrion said with a yawn. Hi everybody, welcome to another re-reading A Song of Ice and Fire video here on God Academy. I'm Gilkid Ron, and we're at the 22nd chapter of A Game of Thrones, Tyrion 3. This is a very good chapter, and another one with a lot of setup and world building. After the first 15 chapters or so had so much action packed into each one of them. Since we're here at God Academy, want to continually give our viewers added value and find new and exciting things to talk about rather than the run-of-the-mill reviews, I came up with a fresh historical perspective for us to look at the events taking place in this chapter. It relates to the whole book and the rest of the story as well. We're gonna look at this moment in the story as representing the interwar period of Westeros, between the devastating and debilitating war called Robert's Rebellion and the upcoming War of the Five Kings, and mostly the coming war against the others. If you're new to this channel, you don't know that we created maybe 150 videos about a song of ice and fire and history, until that well all but dried up. But here we are back with historical comparisons. Tyrion perfectly encapsulates the way of thinking of the interwar period between the two world wars of the 20th century also known as the Interbellum Period. Before I dive in, I'd like to thank patrons Betsy Lace, Chuck Pavek, and Christopher Schwartz for the continuous support on Patreon. Thanks so much, guys. It's deeply appreciated, as I hope you know. So, Tyrion III and the Interbellum Period. A lot of things happened between World War I and World War II, but I want to focus on the inability of Western governments to acknowledge the looming threat of fascism. The slow rise of fascism could be viewed in our story as the gradual rise of the others. We saw them in the prologue when they kill a couple of rangers. That set off a chain of events. A third ranger deserted, got executed by Eddard Stark. Benjen Stark went looking for the party and is now lost too. And the brothers at the watch know that winter is coming and a cataclysmic struggle with it. But we have to remember that when we enter the story, this is not the beginning of the story. We started in the smack dab in the middle with this very big, very disastrous, very dramatic war called Robert's Rebellion. And all the carnage and damage that was done after that, there were no real good guys, no real bad guys in this war as we learn later on. But the ruling elite seems to have a lack of political will to do anything to prepare for the threats ahead, be them the rise of the White Walkers slash others, you know, like the rise of fascism, or even the problems within their own kingdom. Lord Commander Jaor Mormont is in Cassandra's role, warning complacent people of the danger ahead. He's deadly serious the entire chapter, while Tyrion keeps making japes. Winston Churchill famously warned of the threat posed by the rise of Nazism, while his colleagues from the Conservative Party dismissed him. Mormont is not trying to be an alarmist, he's trying to recruit Tyrion to the cause because of Tyrion's proximity to power. Power is another recurring theme in this chapter. Mormont wants Tyrion to use his familial connections to get the political elite to take the threat of the others seriously. Send manpower and soon Tyrion could join the wall himself. Tyrion in this chapter represents the ruling elite's attitude towards the coming danger, much like the political elite of the interbellum period. Tyrion is unwilling to believe the mounting circumstantial evidence, a classic staple of interwar periods. We had one too in Israel after a glorious victory in the war of 1967, refusing to see that our neighbors were hatching a plan and thus getting close to being routed in the devastating war of 1973. And those six years are very different from the period that preceded 67 or the, pre or the period that followed 1973. Because as my podcasting partner puts it, when you're in an interbellum period, 
you don't know it. We recently posted an episode on our podcast, Pod Academy, about Game of Thrones in the interbellum period, focusing more on history and not on this chapter. Here's a snippet of something relevant Rothra had to say, and if you want the whole thing, there's a link in the description. I mean, interbellum is a really weird historical period, right? Like other periods, you know that you are living through one. Like you know when you're in a crisis or in a boom yes. period or whatever. An interbellum, we know afterwards that it's a period that's bookended by two wars. Yes. Once when you're inside one, it's just the mind fuck of are we in one or not? Is there a next war coming? And of course, you'd like to be in denial for as, as long as possible because, mm, yeah. well, I guess there's usually two sides, right? There's the side who's planning to take the other ones into a war. And to then one, yeah, the, <laughs> the setting up the casus belli. Um, mm-hmm. And and they probably want to conceal what they're doing for as long as possible because they're building up, right? And the other side, well, they don't really, like, they don't want to believe that, oh, here we go again. And also they don't want to give the others cause. So you get this long period yes. where there's kind of like, yeah, let's not really. What always happens is that, you know, you're always preparing to refight the, the previous war, right? That all the preparations are for the last war. And of course, that's that's how, then how things go wrong because the next war is not going to be exactly like the last one, and that's where things go haywire. So Tyrion thinks Mormont is rationalizing his desire for his career at the Wall to mean something, but in fact, it is Tyrion, the one who is justifying his lack of will to face the realities. If Tyrion were to accept that there is a danger, that would mean that he would have to take on the entire political establishment, including his father, brother, sister, king, and court, and press on them the coming of the boogeyman coming to kill them all. He will be ridiculed and laughed off, as he says in his internal monologue. We just learned in the previous chapter that Robert's plans include a festive tourney for Ned and a knife for a 13-year-old girl on the other side of the narrow sea. Monsters from the north? What's wrong with you, Tyrion? Have you finally gone mad? So better to just dismiss it all as grumpkins and snarks, even though it is getting harder and harder to do when Tyrion looks beyond the wall. But still, we know complacency will win the day. The Night's Watch political and strategic predicament is woven in very nicely in this chapter into the character of Alice of Thorn, whom Tyrion marks mercilessly. Tyrion is adamant that Thorn is not fit for his job. Keep the ice off your eyes, my good lord. Sir Alistair Thorn should be mucking your stables, not drilling your young warriors. Notice that even though the watch is theoretically egalitarian, the real world creeps in and Mormont explains why highborn rise higher and more quickly than lowborn. This Westerosi world that these grown-ups have built is not equipped for a crisis of global magnitude. And I'm sure you can think of similar examples in our world today. So to Tyrion's remarks, Mormon replies that the watch these days only gets sent stable boys and sneak thieves and rapers. Sir Alistair is an anointed knight, one of the few to take the black since I have been Lord Commander. He fought bravely at King's Landing. Sir Alistair Thorne in this chapter is even more douchey than we thought. With a stick up his ass, he thinks very highly of himself, so Tyrion brings him down a few notches. His weapon is his tongue, but his shield is his last name. He knows no one will dare to kill him and face the wrath of Tywin Lannister. The consequences will be dire for the Watch as a whole. Later in this book, Tywin goes to war when his son gets abducted by Caitlyn and he does it for the family name. So that's the power Tyrion has. Not money, nor the sword. Thor knows what being Tywin's son means, so he tries to get him to a different battlefield and challenges Tyrion to a duel. That's what good generals do in war. Choose the battlefield where they have the advantage. Tyrion is not an idiot, obviously, so he runs circles around Thorn and even pokes him with his fork, literally. Everybody laughs at the expense of Thorn. Thorn is also a great segue for him to tell us about the consequences of the last war, Robert's Rebellion. Thorn fought in the war on the wrong side. You could equate that to World War I, where there weren't the clear good guys and bad guys of World War II. The Germans were on the wrong side. 
and they all had to pay a price. And the people who fought alongside the Targaryens had to pray, had to pay as well. Tywin gave them the choice of taking the black or losing their heads. So since everybody's fighting the previous war, the political elite sees war as a total negative because many of these lords will be on the wrong side. Whoever ends up losing their next imagined war that mirrors the previous one. That's a pretty big deterrent for war. This banishment to the wall also kind of reminded me of the ancient Roman custom of exile to powerful men who lost in the political Game of Thrones. They had to leave Rome behind for some time or for good and be far from the levers of power as punishment for backing the wrong horse in the internal jockeying for a better position in the Roman world. So back to the power theme. Those were concrete examples of Varys's where does power reside riddle in the next book. Tyrion as a person has no power. Anyone at the wall can kill him in a second. He's small, doesn't have personal bodyguards. Yet because power resides where people believe it resides, Alice of Thorn can't kill him, even though he wants to very, very much. And the other brothers at the watch, they need to keep Tyrion safe for fear of reprisal from their own Lord Command. Speaking of that old bear who is near 70 and would love to retire if there was someone who could replace him. He exclaims that the watch is dying. It has no skilled warriors nor enough people who can read and write and even think. The national Westerosi leadership crisis goes beyond the absent king, his partisan hand of the king, Cersei's manipulations and Tywin's machinations. There's a crisis in leadership at the wall too. (laughs) And here's something very short about the show, the HBO show, which I try to never mention on these episodes. But I find it very interesting that Mormont in this chapter didn't even remember who Snow was. Snow? Huh? When in the show, he was very quickly groomed for command. Anyway, there are only 1,000 black brothers left. And, and it's not a real meritocracy because Mormont has to placate the fathers of the lords sent to the wall so he can curry favors later and get more men he so badly needs. Mormont makes his case to Tyrion that experienced rangers have disappeared and a seasoned watch veteran became a deserter unexplicably and had his head chopped off by Ned. Benjen Stark is now gone too. Each of these evidence by itself is insignificant, but taken together? Hmm? Mormont is pulling rank, asking Tyrion, how many winters have you seen? Mm, Tyrion says eight, nine short ones. Oh, sweet summer child. When I was a boy, it was said that a long summer always meant a long winter to come. This summer has lasted nine years, Tyrion. And a tenth will soon be upon us. Think on that. When I was a boy, Tyrion replied, my wet nurse told me that one day, if men were good, the gods would give the world a summer without ending. Perhaps we've been better than we thought. And the great summer is finally at hand. Classic interwar period stuff. Like the conservative British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain, who promised peace in our times, thinking that the Munich Accords with Hitler would pacify the fascist extremists. Also, in his conservative party, he he did have some Nazi sympathizers. I guess that always helps to not see the danger at hand. The Lord Commander though, he has the climate science of the citadel at his side to reinforce his point that winter is coming. He's making a scientific case that monsters are real, but heaven is not. Hmm? Well, I guess it's a hard case to make. He tries anyway in this beautiful dialogue. So Mormont clutches Tyrion tightly by the hand. You must make them understand. I tell you, my lord. The darkness is coming, there are wild things in the woods, direwolves and mammoths and snow bears the size of aurochs and I have seen darker shapes in my dreams. In your dreams, Tyrion echoed, thinking how badly he needed another drink. Mormont was death to the edge of his voice. The fisher folk near Eastwatch have glimpsed white walkers on the shore. This time Tyrion could not hold his tongue. The fisher folk of Lannisport often glimpse merlings. Dennis Malliser writes that the mountain people are moving south, sleeping past the Shadow Tower, in numbers greater than ever before. They are running, my lord, but running from what? These are old bones, Lannister, but they have never felt a chill like this. 
tell the king what I say, I pray you, winter is coming. And when the long night falls, only the Night's Watch will stand between the realm and the darkness that sweeps from the north. The gods help us all if we are not ready. But Tyrion doesn't want to talk about it. He was sleepy from wine and tired of doom. Ah, he thinks Mormont and the Watch take themselves too seriously. But Maester Aemon, he takes Tyrion seriously. When he speaks, more like whispers, everyone falls silent and listens. And Aemon says that Tyrion is a giant come among us, here at the end of the world. The end of the world is a clear reference he made to Hadrian's Wall and the edge of the Roman Empire in Britannica, beyond which lived monsters and barbarians. Tyrion didn't know what to say to the Maester's compliment. So the Maester thinks highly of Tyrion, but this giant will disappoint the Watch and not get anything done for them. Though Martin does tell us that Tyrion Lannister was as good as his word. And this coming after chapters that tell us that Tyrion tried to assassinate Bran, he is confusing us. Are we with the Starks or with the Lannisters? Somebody's lying. Mm. So when does Tyrion's perspective of the situation of the wall change? When he goes up on a whim to the top of the wall instead of retiring to his warm chambers? He doesn't even know why he's going up there. And up there, He's not dismissive nor cocky. He feels that some things cannot be explained away by cynicism. Behind the king's tower, the wall glimmered in the light of the moon, immense and mysterious. As he stood there and looked at all the darkness with no fires burning anywhere, with the wind blowing and the cold like a spear in his guts, Tyrion Lannister felt as though he could almost believe the talk of the others, the enemy in the night, his jokes of grumpkins and snarks no longer seemed quite so droll. He looked off to the east and west at the walls stretching before him, a vast white road with no beginning and no end and a dark abyss on either side. Mm. Experiencing something is different than being told something. There are some things you cannot understand unless you experience them, say the rise of fascism. In the 1930s, it had never happened before, so it, could, so it could be easily dismissed. Now that we know that fascism is a danger to humankind, dismissing Cassandras is not as easy as it used to be, though many do still try to dismiss them. Up there, Tyrion tells us that the Night's Watch permitted the forest to come no closer than half a mile of the north face of the wall. A security zone, a security strip, hmm? to allow no cover for enemies. That reminded me of the Israeli policy in the Gaza Strip, raising all homes and vegetation 100 meters beyond the fence into Gaza territory. Anyway, Tyrion is a different person up there. He says that the forest has crept back over the decades to the north face of the wall in some parts. The gray-green sentinels and pale white weirwoods had taken root in the shadow of the wall itself. It's the axes <laughs> that have kept the forest in front of Castle Black at bay. Tyrion continues, it was never far though. From up here, Tyrion could see it, the dark trees looming beyond the stretch of open ground, like a second wall built in parallel to the first one, a wall of night. Few axes had ever swung in that black wood, where the moonlight could not penetrate the ancient tangle of root and thorn and grasping limb. Out there, the trees grew huge, and the rangers said they seemed to brood and you not men. It was a small wonder that the Night's Watch named it the Haunted Forest. Hmm, he doesn't sound so dismissive to me. So, we discussed the lack of political will and the lack of ability to face a looming and common threat. We talked about power and where does it reside. We talked about how personal experience creates our perception of the world. Had Tyrion joined the wall, I believe he would have quite quickly become a fierce advocate of the Night's Watch. But as ancient Chinese philosophers say, out of sight, out of mind. Now let's talk about Tyrion's conversation upon the top of the wall with someone who considers him a friend. Who goes there? Halt! Tyrion stopped. If I had... If I halt too long, 
a freezing place, John. Notice, he doesn't call him bastard. John looked bigger and heavier in his watch attire. Ghost was as big as Tyrion's chest and would only grow bigger. What are you doing up here tonight besides freezing your manhood off? You see, this is how you do a balls joke with Tyrion. Hmm? Freezing your manhood off. There's style here. Anyway, Thorn is getting back at John with guard duty. He wants him to be tired in training. John says, so far I have disappointed him. John is getting to know his brothers. He's helping them more than Thorn is. Hmm? His change in attitude is bearing fruit and Tyrion was the one who gave him the best fatherly advice. What has Ned given him that has helped him with his new life at the wall? Hmm? Bubkus. So Tyrion and John walk together. And John sounded to Tyrion strangely sad that Tyrion is leaving tomorrow. John wants to know if Tyrion could bear a message for Rob. And Japes that he's going to be such a great Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. He's gonna Lord Commander it like you've never seen before. The Night's Watch is going to win so much, they're gonna get tired of winning. Kofefe. Anyways, John says that he'll keep the North so safe and Winterfell so safe that Rob might as well take up needlework with the girls and have Mick and melt down his sword for horseshoes. So John accepts that the danger lies to the North. But the more pressing danger to the Starks lies in the South. Later, John wants Tyrion to help him with Bran. Tyrion doesn't know how. You gave me help when I needed it. I gave you nothing, words. Then give your words to Bran too. You're asking a layman to teach a cripple how to dance. Still, I know what it is to love a brother, Lord Snow. I will give Bran whatever small help is in my power. This is another example of this theme in this chapter of how personal experience shapes how we view the world. And in this case, it allows Tyrion to empathize with Jon's love for Bran. I guess that's a very hard thing to imagine. A person loving somebody from his family. Wow, such a rare <laughs> occurrence in human history. Anyways, Jon is very happy. Thank you, my lord of Lannister. Jon pulled off his glove and offered his bare hand. Friend. Tyrion found himself oddly touched. Most of my kin are bastards. He said with a wry smile, but you're the first I've had to friend. He pulled a glove off with his teeth and clasped Snow by the hand, flesh against flesh. The boy's grip was firm and strong. Mm. Tyrion is a mensch. Mm. He's a good guy. Tyrion followed him and side by side they stood upon the edge of the world. There are more cool things to talk about in this chapter, like how Mormon speaks of the dishonor his son Jorah brought on him, as this very Jorah continues to dishonor himself by conspiring against Daenerys. There's also Tyrion acknowledging the simple people at the wall, feeling empathy towards them, very much unlike his fellow highborn he sees beyond class. But we're out of time. I'd like to invite you to subscribe to this channel to not miss our future videos and better yet hit the bell so you'll get a notification whenever we post a new re-reading video there will be plenty of more exciting things to explore i already have so many ideas of really cool explorations for the upcoming chapters so thank you for watching thank you patrons for supporting our work through patreon.com slash pod academy that's patreon.com slash pod academy the link is in the description. Change the name of the Patreon page after the podcast. Also, check out our podcast, Pod Academy. It's super cool about history and movies, science in movies, and many, many, many more stuff. So bye now and see you next time. Bye-bye.